It's now my delight to introduce our second keynote speaker for today, Dr. Laodi M. Sharif, the Commissioner for Corruption Eradication Commission in the Republic of Indonesia. Prior to his appointment as the Commissioner of Corruption Eradication Commission, or the KPK, in December 2015, Dr. Laodi M. Sharif was a senior lecturer at the Hassanuddin, I hope I got that right, uh, University Law School in Makassar, and had also lectured at a number of other law schools. He graduated with a Bachelor of Law degree at the Law Faculty of the Hassan Nuddin University, received his Master of Law degree from the Faculty of Law Queensland University of Technology, and obtained his Doctor of Philosophy from Sydney University School of Law, specialising in envir international environmental law. Dr. Sharif has worked for many national and international anti-corruption and environmental law organisations, including the Anti-Corruption Academic Initiative of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime and the International Union for Conservation of Nature Academy of Environmental Law. He was instrumental in the development of anti-corruption, good governance, judicial reform, and environmental law enforcement programs in Indonesia for the Indonesian National Police, the Attorney General's Office, the National Planning Agency, and the Ministry of Environment and Policy Forestry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharif. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, IBEC uh, for inviting me to share some of the work that we do in Indonesia in the KPK. And I think uh, Sarah has already give us a global pictures of corruption, so my presentation may be just like a footnote uh, of that presentation. Uh, but they asked me actually to talk about how to address political corruption in Indonesia, but the things I cannot help myself is not to tell you about the current situations of my office, is Corruption Eradication Commissions in Indonesia. I think if you look at the pictures and the feeling that we feel at the moment in Indonesia, it is represented by these students in front of the parliament in Indonesia in September this year. He is protesting for the change of the KPK law and several other law, which by the people, by the Indonesian people thinks it is not reflecting the need of the Indonesians in general. So welcome to the landscape of Indonesian politics, the rich, the bad, and the ugliest. Yeah, we have now 15, actually 14, political parties in Indonesia. And all of them, I think, they hate KPK. What is actually political corruption? By definition, is the use of power by elected officials, government officials, or their network for illegitimate private gain, which is actually already explained by Sarah and some speaker yesterday. I try to go back a little bit. What is the impact of corruption? based on United Nations Convention Against Corruption, yeah, slow economic developments, violating human rights, undermine democratic institutions. Unfortunately, sometimes they use democratic platforms just trying to steal from the government and to steal from the state, preferring the rule of law. And I think the most important ones it hurts the poor first. The oligarchs of 
Indonesian political party. If you look at the whole 14 political parties in Indonesia, most political parties are owned by the oligarchs. The ruling party at the moment, for example, PDIP, it is owned by Megawati. So if you want to be a top leader in that particular political party, you have to have a friend with her or her daughters or her brothers, etc. All several big political parties. Fortunately, I think Australia, we have a better political party systems. It is not owned by, people, by someone. And most categorization process based on family ties and favoritisms. So if you want to compare the political party in Indonesia, maybe the closest similarity may be India or the Philippines or maybe some other developing countries. And the political party is actually managed just like a family companies. It is their reality. So it is difficult to hope for the ideal objective and how the political parties should conduct their soul. If you look at the political party finance of Indonesia, as no political party are willing to disclose their source of fund, for example. There is no mandatory audit from the governments because they say this is not the government fund. And there is no comprehensive report on the utilization of the fund. And of course, the mix between politics and company. But these features, it is maybe also occurred in many other countries. For example, even in Australia or the United States. But this is the reality. So sometimes it is so difficult to put our hope on politicians. If you look at the categorization problems in Indonesia, most political parties have no stable categorization process. Most cadres are from business background. If you have the money, the political party actually will back you up if you want to be mayors, representative, or become a governor, for example. And young cadres sometimes actually demotivated because they have no a clear future. So the cadre from one particular party actually can jump from one particular party to another party easily because there is no clear ideology. It is quite difficult to imagine laborers jump to liberal, for example. In Indonesia, if you are Gorka, you jump to the PDAP, you jump to another party, it is common. Or to jump from Republican to Democrat in US, it is kind of like a difference because they have a clear ideology within their political party, not in Indonesia. As you can see, our president just appointed his opponent as the Ministry of Defense. It is strange, but yet it's happening in my beloved country. Ethic enforcement. Actually, what I'm explaining, it is actually the result of rigorous research by the KPK and Indonesian Science Institute. So I'm not just made it up. This is the result of two years' research involving all political parties, involving experts, and involving civil society groups. Ethic enforcement, for example, it is almost unheard of. Exists in the book, but very rare to be enforced. 
and it has never become the main priority. For example, supporting former convicted corruptors for new public positions is normal. And they won the elections. At least three victims of the KPK when after they served their jail terms, a supported again by political party, and they won election to become mayors in several districts in Indonesia. I'll give you a little bit of hard evidence of political corruptions. They are the faces of political corruptions in Indonesia. Quite a lot. And most of them actually smiling in the front of the KPK office. So many people actually asking, what happens in the mind of those people? They're always smiling. And so the people actually suggesting the KPK to handcuff them just to reduce the smiley face in their face. It is a close-up. And they are leader of political parties, most of them. And I'll give you six. In the, left side, the right side of mine, he was the Speaker of Indonesian Parliament. He was the President of Golkar Party, one of the biggest political parties in Indonesia. And the people, and the guy with the hat, the, the white hat, it is actually the President of Islamic-based political party which is all of them are the ruling party. And the one in circle here, it is from the oppositions, which is called PAN. So they all six are a leader of political party in Indonesia. And the one in the middle, actually, former ministry, minister of religious affairs. All of them still in jail. And for the Speaker of the Parliament, Setia Novanto, he got 15 years in jail. But not only the legislative, even the prophet of the Indonesian law is in jail. He is, for God's sake, the Chief Justice of the highest court in Indonesia. And he is taking bribe from governors and mayors, because one of the powers of the Constitutional Court, it is actually to settle uh, the case of general elections. And this is a example of corruption in preferring the rule of law. But thanks to God, we send him to jail for life, and he is the highest sentence ever in Indonesia. And I think he deserved it. So that's what we are doing. From 2004, 2019, we are sent to jail to 147 members of parliament, 27 ministers, 20 governors, more than 100 mayors, nine commissioners, four ambassadors, one governor of Central Bank, and five deputy governor of the Central Bank of Indonesia. So my students keep asking me, how much is the salary of the governor of Central Bank? And what is actually his job? And I say, can you give me, show me a note? One of his main jobs is actually signing the money. <laughs> But he is still taking money that he signed. From law enforcement agencies, justices of constitutional court, 22 judges, four high-ranking police, 
and seven prosecutors. And now we are also looking at incorporations because in the past we only going for an individuals. But when I joined the commissions December 2015, because in our law, actually we can actually, there is in our law but corporate criminal liability. So we are also pursuing companies now. If you look at the record with 100 conviction rates, it is not me saying it. We are, the KPK is the most notorious anti-corruption agency in the world. Because we are investigating or charging about almost 200 cases a year. But compared to the report that we receive, we are receiving about 7,000 complaints a year. Not all of them corruptions. Some of them petty corruption, which is we do not have the authority to do it because we are only focused on big fish. And we are only focused if the object of corruption is about 1 billion Indonesian rupiah or around 100,000 Australian dollars. We do not go below that because it is the police who are actually doing the small corruptions. So the real impact of political corruption is that, as look at our corruption perception index, only 38 So we have to admit it, Indonesia is still a very corrupt country. Yeah, we are increasing the score, but still a very bad one. But of course, if you compare it, we are now the fourth in ASEAN. When we started, we are lower than Philippines. We are lower than Thailand. And now we are actually higher than them. And also, if you look at corruption hit the poor first, based on the Indonesian Statistic Bureau's number of people actually who are under poverty line, is more than 20 million Indonesian, which is equal to the size, the whole population of Australia. But if you look at actually the report from the World Bank, it is about 40 million which is a combination of Malaysia and Australia. And the Gini ratio, it is a reflection of inequality. Our Gini ratio 2019, it is 0 0.382. And the rich 1% of Indonesia is controlled 53% of the Indonesian economy. If you want to read the details, read the Indonesia Rising Divide. And the current number, they say, it is 1% Indonesians, the rich Indonesian control, 43% of Indonesian economy. Just a gentle comparison with Russia, for example where the inequality, it is almost the same in Indonesia. I like this graph simply because it is not in the law book, it is not in the journal of like good governance, for example, but it is actually from the journal of physics. <laughs> but they use mathematic calculations in how to measure the inequality. Another big fish, in December 2019, we just actually charged, formally charged, the Ministry of Yacht and Sport. Now it is under custody in our office. And we are naming corruption suspect related to oil and gas. 
So when Sarah says actually mentioned about energy, natural resources, yes, is the most corrupt sectors. So that's why one of the main focus of the KPK work, it is on natural resources extractions. And I think Australia should also look at that sectors. Being living in Australia and studying in Australia, these sectors is need serious watch. So what is the issue and challenges in fighting corruption in Indonesia? Yeah, corruptors are fight back. They are rich, they are powerful compared to me, just small guy on the street. For example, one of my prosecutors actually attacked with acid. Now he is blind. The KPK leadership under attack, that's my humble house, is attacked with Molotov. And they put bomb in defense of another commission. Not only that, daily intimidations through WhatsApp, through email, through whatever, and using necessary means. As you can see, it was January 2019. The police, they haven't found it. And the attacker of novel bus freedoms, my senior investigators, it is already three years. They couldn't find it. But we can easily track terrorist suspect in Indonesia in a week. So who are they? I think we know. So the political party and the government is conspiring to kill the KPK. They think that we are too powerful. And the ruling party and its coalitions just September support the amendment of the KPK law. And it is actually led by the ruling coalitions. And during campaign, they said, we are going to double or to triple the budget of the KPK. That was the promise of them. After they win the elections, they just changed the law without any single consultation with us. The students actually protest. Hundred thousands of students all over Indonesia are protesting. So we are actually trying to meet the presidents and the speaker of the parliament, they closed their doors. I went to my, myself with Mr. August Rogers, commissioner of the KPK, and one of my legal bureau staff. I went to the Ministry of Law and Justice just to ask, can you show us the draft of the amended law? And they say, no. Because it's been consulted with people. I say, who is the people? This is our house. So if you, if you want to refer this the house, then at least let us know which part of the house that you are going to change. They say, no. We will invite you to parliament for the discussions. And we will keep waiting. And until they knock the table and say the KPK law it is changed. There was no one invitation or letter. In fact, the final law we just received it in the 18 or 19 of October.
So we are waiting for the wisdom of the president to save the KPK. Because he said on the media, is considering to issue government regulation in lieu of that particular law. But I think the change is very, very slim because this law, it is from his political party. So the KPK role is in doubt as a new law takes effect. This is 17 October. This is the ideal law for anti-corruption agencies, which is the KPK used to be, and a good example, because we are independent, and we are accountable and transparent, and I think our capacity is not, I think it's good enough. But of course, if you look at in the red one, it is not permanent. If you look at, so we still actually want to have that fulfilled, but now it is changed. So what is actually the features of the new KPK law? In the past, we are independent. In the new law, now stated clearly under the executive. And the KPK officers become general civil servants, can be easily removed by the executive. And they are all installing oversight council appointed by the president within the KPK. And the wiretapping, asset confiscation, search warrants, for example, it has to be there is a written permission from the oversight council. So it is means that he is not actually oversight. This is not an oversight, but it's a part of the executive of the KPK. So they're the, the clawing the KPK and the whole process of legislation conducted in secret without the involvement of the KPK at all. I just give you a little bit of labels, what the previous commissioners actually experienced. Malicious criminal proceeding against the KPK commissioners. Every time we are investigating high-ranking officers, high-ranking police officers, they are always trying to kill us. Fortunately, the people of Indonesia actually behind us. Based on the survey of independence organizations, our approval rate is never below 84% of the Indonesian populations. We are the most trusted institutions in Indonesia. But we are not loved by the politicians. So, the true defenders of anti-corruption agency, it is the people. It's not the politicians, because the Indonesian politicians said the establishment of KPK law, it was an accident in the history of Indonesia. Because the establishment of the KPK law, it is after Suharto stepped down. But people still united behind us. I joined KPK because I believe in the value of the KPK. And the politicians know it. So every campaign, they always say, we are going to support the KPK. Double day budget strengthens their human powers. But it is always different after they won elections. So please, 
never ever put your hope on the politicians. And please pray for those guys. They are protesting the KPK law and they sacrifice their law, their, their life. Larandi, Yusuf Qadawi, Akbar Alamsah, Bagus P. Mahendra, Maulana Suryadi. They got killed in September because of protesting and defending us. So I wish the poor soul of those students rest in power and their patriotic blood will become the seed, the root, the trunk, the branch, the twig, the leaves, the flowers, and the fruit of the nation that I love. I thank you so much. What an extraordinarily powerful um, address that was. Thank you so much. And um, to think that there is such a considerable personal, professional, and ultimately human cost to defending the work of the Anti-Corruption Commission in Indonesia is a pretty salutary uh, issue for all of us who generally don't face that level of personal um, and family uh, risk. And to think that you are continuing to fight um, to maintain the independence and the work of the KPK um, in the face of the deaths of those young men and the attacks on your own family, the attacks on previous commissioners is um, quite extraordinary. So um, all power to you and I'm sure that um, in any way that we can help from Australia in the anti-corruption community, people will be reaching out and hoping to support the work that you do because it really is um, quite extraordinary. Um, please join me again in thanking Dr. Sheriff.